you can find my contacts here if you want to reach me. And I think we all agree that the world we're navigating is getting more and more VUCA. Just those of you who have your cameras on, how many are familiar with the VUCA term uh, by now? Not all. Okay, so, so basically what we're facing today globally, we can see that because we have these smartphones and we're much more interconnected, the changes we're facing are much more volatile. They're, we, they're much faster. If something goes well, it can be a trend and it can be, you go really well, really fast. But also if something goes bad, it can go bad quite fast. And we face a larger uncertainty today. And you can of course say that the world has always been uncertain, but we have been able to be protected from that uncertainty, maybe from state television uh, or the king or somebody telling us how things are and living in an illusion of certainty, while now we can't really be protected from that. What we also see, this is some me mega trends, is that the complexity is rising. It's more and more, just imagine how many systems you log into, how many different connections you have, and also just reflect on now versus 10 or 20 years ago, how spread out are your contacts on LinkedIn or Facebook or the people you are in touch with? So there is a complexity in values and worldviews all over the world that is increasing the more we become interconnected. And there is a larger and larger ambiguity. And the most, best example here, I think, is food. I mean, if I told you that I had a healthy breakfast today, what would you know about me? Like 20 or 30 years ago, at least in Sweden, we had like the healthy food platter and the government recommended you what to eat and what was healthy. Uh, so you should have some greens, you should have some protein, and you should actually have two pieces of bread to each meal. That was a recommended healthy platter. And today, when I say I had a healthy breakfast, you have no clue if I ate egg and bacon like crazy and lots of fat and protein, or if I had uh, raw food, or if I didn't have breakfast because I'm on, I'm on the warrior diet or whatever. And there is research supporting all of that. So there is a, many different stories that we need to navigate. Uh, and this makes it hard. And this makes it also harder to be a leader. It makes it harder to make choices today than uh, earlier. And of course, it makes it harder for us also to make progress towards the global goals, the, the 17 UN goals for sustainable development. I, I think you all recognize them. And this is a beautiful example of when we have taken the complexity in the world in all these systems interacting, starting with ourselves, our families, uh, organizations, societies, and so on, and try to reduce the complexity to something that is relatable and understandable. I mean, the world doesn't consist of 17 boxes. Nobody thinks that. But we created a framework where we could relate to the challenges through this uh, global goals. And what stuck, struck us, I've uh, been working for the Oak Island Foundation, the Eckhart Foundation, the board for the last seven years, that we hadn't done this with inner development. This is all about external stuff, more or less. Uh, but for us to reach this, we really need to work with internal, internal shifts and skills, as I, as I were saying. And we need to do it systemically and all of us collectively, not just some CEOs or HR managers caring about this and others don't. And then you have a shift and then the people could actually throw out frameworks uh, that I experienced a lot of pain with when you've been working with, on something that you think is good and then it just thrown out. And this is harder to throw out because this is, we all collectively decided on this. And our question was, can we together with other companies, with the universities, agree on a framework or co-create a framework. And here IKEA is, it was very early on supporting us and say, what capacities, qualities, or skills do we think are essential for us to develop both individually and collectively in order not just to feel well or to manage the complexity, but in order for us to actually get closer to the global goals. And this was the, it took us almost a month to formulate this question. And we did it with, together with some of the best researchers in the world. We had Amy Edmondson from Harvard Business School uh, who created the psychological safety term and uh, uh, teaming, you might know her from that. We had Peter Senge 
who work a lot with sustainability and system thinking, Otto Scharmer, uh, many, many others. Uh, and we said, can we create a framework that we call the inner development goals? There are transformational skills for sustainable development. And I thought that you would get a taste of this today and see if you can relate that to yourself, if you want to relate that to your team or to the organization that you're working with, and to the world. If you think this is needed, if you want to help us co-create this, if you want to get involved or just get inspired. Does it sound meaningful to reflect on this? Just thumb up, thumb down. Uh, and I'll try to leave some room for questions uh, at the end. What I would also recommend for you to get the most out of this, uh, let's say next 25, 30 minutes, is that you have a pen and paper. And as I go through the different skills, I mean, you, you will get the presentation, but just reflect how good are you? How much of these skills do you have in you today? Uh, and how good are you in your team or your organization to foster and create a culture that fosters those skills? So you can just, I don't know, you can use any, we're trying to create with some scientists now a self-assessment. We haven't uh, even have uh, created our first draft. So you can choose any scale you like. It can be one to five or one to three or one to a hundred. Uh, and just reflect on each skill. How, how much do I have this? Uh, so maybe you can see where, where you're already good and where you want to grow. So there are five categories. Uh, when we, this, this is a framework, by the way, that is co-created by more than a thousand people, researchers, experts in sustainability, psychologists, human development. Uh, and we've done several surveys, and then we had two groups massaging it. First of all, we had two scientists coding independently and then creating uh, buckets both for the skills, but also for the broader categories. Uh, and then we had both a scientist group and a communication group trying to see uh, what is truthful to stay to the survey and to the science, but also what is, how can we communicate this easily? And these categories are uh, more the communications group way of saying, how do we understand this? And there is, if you want to read the full report on our webpage, you have more scientific terms and so on to these different categories. But the first category is basically how we relate to ourselves or how we show up or our, our being in the world. Uh, of course, a part of that being is how we think. Uh, and here the big shifts, as you will see, is going more from linear thinking to more systemic thinking. Uh, and how do we do that? Relating is more the emotional part of us, how we care for others and the world and what we see as our circle of care. How broad, broad is that? How inclusive is that? And I heard some very beautiful remarks on that as I entered just before my speech. Uh, thank you, it just got me inspired again. And of course, then how do we collaborate with others, uh, both social skills and collaborating skills? And last but not least, the actual doing the acting, the driving of change. And we'll go into each of these categories and there there will be a subset of, there's total 23 skills. And um, let's see and reflect together when we dive into this. So let's take them one by one. As you see, the first one is inner camp compass. And this is a lot about reflecting about your personal values and understanding them, uh, what values you have, and how come you have those values. And this is important for many reasons, because first of all, you can see in the science and research that if you are grounded in your inner compass, you will much easier handle the uncertainty, uh, the complexity, the vuca the VUCA world, if you remember uh, at the start. It will be easier for you to navigate that and recover from stress, not to burn out, to be personally sustainable. But the second part, and maybe even most important, as our world become more interconnected and we are in touch with many people from different values, different cultures, if you, have, if you can take your own values as an object and look at them and reflect upon them, okay, so I have the value of awareness or meaning, 
or welcoming people. Well, the, the value of being inclusive and welcoming is very important for me because I, I'm from Ukraine originally and I moved around a lot when I was a kid. And it's really, really important for me to, to get people to feel welcome because I'm usually the person standing outside and thinking, how the hell did I get into this group when I was a kid at least? Um, then I can also reflect and understand people who have other values that I, I do not share and not just think that they are strange because there are cultures that are more welcoming. Uh, I love it here in uh, Latin America because it's, it's a very welcoming and warm culture. Sweden is not so welcoming, to be honest. It's, it has many other beautiful qualities, but it's not the warmest country, uh, culture. So, you know, sometimes they say we travel to discover the values we have lost. Uh, and here to really know your own values will help you to better understand and reflect upon and collaborate with people with different values. Of course, it will also connect down to integrity, authenticity, honesty. You can see that people who are in touch with their own values, we, we all have values. We don't always act on them. Sometimes we act out of fear, uh, out of anger. The worst deeds people do when they are, act out of guilt or shame. Uh, but we have these deep layers of our being, which is our values, and that helps us to not, not only knowing the values, because that's one thing, but actually acting on them, being acting with integrity, authenticity. Then there is also a mindset here, a bit of a cognitive part that is about the openness and learning. Spotify, one of the other companies that has been contributing to this initiative, they educate all their leaders in how to hold uncertainty and how to not just dismiss things that are different, that you don't understand, how to have a bit more patience and reflection when you hear something that is strange or different. Uh, and I think we all have that. We all want to just like, oh, no, no, that's just craziness. So basically, how do you keep that, especially as we grow older? Because the older we get, usually the less open we become. We, be, we grow more and more conservative uh, and close-minded, unfortunately, if we do not work with ourselves. And this is a skill that you can train. The self-awareness part is uh, a lot about what, what I spoke about values, but to, to see patterns within, uh, to be able to reflect and take feelings as an object, desires, but also... I mean, you can have values are ideals and you can have a lot of thoughts about your values, but then if you don't have a realistic self-image where you truly are today, you're in trouble. And, you know, some of the worst leaders when, or most leaders that create most pain and harm are leaders who are out of touch with reality, as Otto Sharmer uh, many times says. Uh, it's when you think that you're in one way, but actually... The reality is very different. The 360s are very good there. Uh, and of course, the last one to reflect on also, how good are you to be in the moment? Uh, not to live in the past or the future and just see, try to see the reality as it is without the judgments, without the labels, but just there is a lot of denial going on uh, and not just them, but we all try to push away painful insights and presence help, helps us with that. Just a reflection here, how many here have a meditative practice? They meditate or pray or somehow work on their ability to stay present, just thumbs up or some, not all. And again, I strongly recommend this. There is so much research. There are so many ways of working with this. And just by writing a diary, by meditating, by having some kind of contemplative practice where you zoom out and reflect is really, really help helpful for the being part. And please also like write in the chat, uh, let's do that after each session and I'll continue speaking. If you have any good tools or thoughts on like, how, what do you do to build this? One or two words, like how do you build the capacity of being and showing up? And you know, some people have this strong way of being and you can feel it. It's, you know, the, the Indian word guru, the Hindi word means heavy. It's like strong in being. So how do you become a guru in the being? Let's move to critical thinking and thinking in general. And what we have been trained in, at least to some parts in our university is being critical. 
in our postmodern society, usually there is a dualism. Some people don't have enough critical thinking and some people are deep skeptics and overdo the critical thinking and they try to deconstruct everything. So here I want to ask you a question. Basically, are you usually too naive or are you too skeptical? Which part do you lean to? Do you need to become more critical or do you actually need to become less critical and try to see the, the possibilities and the holes in it? Like what, what, what is actually possible? What, what am I not seeing? Let's, before I go in and deconstruct, can we build this idea a bit more? Complexity awareness is, is a very interesting skill. Uh, when we talk about thinking, people many times go and think about IQ. And you know, there is, I would say there is four level, four ways of measuring IQ. You have the um, spatial thinking, like you turn in the different quadrants and see, see them from different perspectives. I'm terrible at that. Uh, I heard that fighter pilots or pilots need to be really good in that three-dimensional thinking. Then you have the mathematical, logical, the verbal, and then you have the factor X or the complexity awareness. And that's not solving problems, but identifying problems. And more and more managers, I know at Ericsson, that they realize that if you're a top manager at Ericsson, you have a high IQ. You're good at solving problems. If you become 100, you're really smart. But it doesn't mean that you're good at complexity awareness and understanding and identifying problems. And this is really, really interesting because people who, who are dyslectic are much better at this because they're much better at seeing holes. They're, they have a three or four times bigger chance of succeeding as entrepreneurs because they're good at identifying patterns. So we really need to involve all people with all different skills. And this we can train much more the, the least, the stuff that we can train least is the, the three-dimensional thinking. We can grow in all our uh, thinking abilities and IQs, but complexity awareness is especially the one that we can train, and we're not trained in that in school. We just get a problem that we need to solve. We don't train in identifying problems. How good are you with that? I think if you're here, you're quite good with that. Perspective skills is not only seeing different perspectives, but actually asking people for their perspectives and trying to bring perspectives together. And here, this is a paradox. And listen carefully now, because what I'm going to say is, I think, the most important part here in this thinking level. Uh, people who are good in perspective taking, who see many perspectives themselves, usually are not as good as pers at, at perspective seeking that is going out to people and say, hey, I have, I have this problem. What, what do you think about this? Because they think that they already have a lot of perspectives because they're fast in their head to see different perspectives. I'm one of those people. I, I have a very easy time seeing a problem from different perspectives. And many times I've been bad at going to people and actually asking for their viewpoint. And here we can learn this. And this is one of the top leadership skills. If you want to navigate complexity, you need to really be well when at seeking out other people and getting them to talk with each other and creating systems that are sharing perspectives. We also can and need to develop in our sense making. And what is that? I mean, we're always making sense of the world. But here I want to ask you a question. How many have experienced sometimes in their lives when something happened, and many times actually it's a, it's a challenging uh, situation, and then you come to a crossroad and you realize that you have a choice how to interpret this challenge. You can either choose this way of seeing it or this way, and then you chose a way of seeing it that was more constructive, and you realize that if you have chosen the other path, it would have meant a lot of trouble for you. How many have had an experience like that? I just want to see some hands. A few, yeah. Uh, and this is, this is really important because Susan Kukreuter, who is at Harvard in um, maturity, maturity in thinking and in uh, creating meaning, she says that becoming, she calls it construct aware, but it's basically aware of how your stories are influencing your life and your being. And it, she says that it's only about one third of the leaders who ever reach that stage when they do this consciously and often. 
Many people have experienced it one or two times where they can choose how to make sense of a story. But most people, they just make sense automatically. And once you become aware about how your story making is influencing your own life and others, you can start choosing more consciously to create stories around things that are happening to you that are emotionally challengeable, challenging, and helping the team, the organization to create stories that are actually constructive. And I think this is a very important and underrated skill. So last but not least, long-term orientation. How many here has heard about the Native American tradition of when making big decisions, thinking seven generations ahead? How many have heard about that concept? No, not, not, not many. Uh, those, I mean, the, 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 there is a tradition where they say like when they make big decisions, they need to think seven generations ahead. I always thought about that. And, and I mean, cognitively, I found it inspiring, the idea. But like, how do you do that? I mean, seven generation, my God, I, I find it hard to think seven years ahead. You know, it's almost impossible. And I was in Berlin at a conference and a researcher did an exercise that put around one third of the room to tears. And I'm thinking about doing that exercise or inviting her to do the exercise on the next Inner Development Goals conference on the 29th of April. What she did was she, every row, we were sitting maybe 300 people. She said, every row, please turn around and stand up. So we were facing each other in rows. And then she said, now imagine, let's play with our imagination and visionaries. Imagine that humanity has survived for seven generations and by a miracle, you are able to meet a person seven generations ahead. And you are able to speak to that person. And she said, those who are facing the scene are the ones living in today's world. Those who are facing the other way are the seven generations ahead. And the most interesting thing is she told us she, she gave us two scenarios and she told us to speak how we feel and think about our current time from scenario one. Uh, humanity is struggling seven generations ahead and barely surviving and the planet is in a really bad state. And the seven generations people ahead, they come and they ask a question, we know that it is in your lifetime that we chose paths that took us to this reality and way of living. Please tell us, how does it feel to live in the world today knowing that this will happen? Please share what is your ways of thinking that is limiting you and that is creating this future. And people could speak for 10 minutes and the others just listening. And then the second scenario, when she said, oh, humans from seven generations uh, back, we have songs and poems to, to celebrate how you managed to navigate this very challenging time and create a flourishing world where we uh, honor you as our ancestor. Please tell me, what ways of thinking and doing helped you on this important transition? Please tell me how it was to live in this very challenging, but yet so interesting time. And people could speak about that. And just imagine exercises like that and how do we work with creating more long-term visioning and reflections for ourselves, for our teams, and what tools do we have to create more long-term orientation? For me personally, my father actually, this is why I'm into personal development also, he taught me a routine that he did each year, the day before New Year, he always had the day off and he was just writing. He was looking through his calendar the whole year that what he has done. And he always picked like the 10 best moments uh, from the year. What, what did he really enjoy? What was the most fun, the most meaning? What was the most painful moments? I mean, reflecting backwards and then the creating a vision for the year to come. And I've been doing that every year since I was 16. And imagine how that, I mean, it, it grown into an, a process of its own for me and doing that, and I've been doing it with many teams and not just one year ahead. I'm challenging my team, even though it's hard to think five, seven, 20 years ahead. 
and dream and reflect on that. And why not seven generations ahead? So I hope this gives some inspiration and some thoughts for you. Okay, let's come to relating. And uh, the first one about appreciation, I wanna share the most odd study that you might hear about today at least. Uh, there was some scientists uh, looking into sects, into different religious sects and what made uh, the sects stay together and when did they dissolve. And in their dis disputation, so this was a PhD, uh, he said, you know that sects can really be really, really strange. And with so many different strange rituals and routines, but what they found is that when the community loses the value of joy, gratitude, or appreciation, when there is no more joy, it's only a matter of time before it, dissol it dissolves. So we can take a lot of pain, we can take a lot of challenges, but we need to feel joy and appreciation and gratitude, even in the strangest religious sects that are harmful to people. And it, it's not so funny to joke about that, but I mean, just to take that as a very extreme example, joy is something that is so fundamental for us. And it's a muscle. Martin Seligman has written a lot about how we can build appreciation and joy in life just by thinking about, as I said, things that we're grateful for during the year that has passed. No matter how your life looks like, I just ask you now, what is the one thing you're grateful about right now? With your body, what is functioning in your body quite well? I mean, you can probably see me. Maybe you can hear me. Uh, what, what are you grateful for about your work? What do you enjoy most about your work? And this is called appreciative inquiry. And we need to work much more with that because when we do that, our perspectives become broader and we feel more connected to people. I just look at the other people on the screen. If you, if you just have the speaker mode, see that you, if you can see the others here also and see, can you feel connected to this community? Do you feel that you belong? with these people and if you're willing put on your camera and just just do that for a second or two or think about the people around you can you feel say, them? make everybody put their cameras on that's a, a request if you're willing it's it, it, it's a request but it, it, it's voluntarily uh, and this we can practice uh, we can practice this and not only with people but with i've been to nature quests i've been doing uh, there are many people and a lot of science now that show that if you put people in nature, the longest I've done is 10 days with four days of fasting. Also a very ancient tradition that they used to do with leaders. There is a um, very famous leadership development coach, Göran Genvi in Sweden. He's done this even with the Swedish king and with the Afjokning family and many others where he just put people in the wood. You say here, sit on the stone and just be quiet for two hours and see what happens. Don't do anything and what it does with our connectedness. And here the social media is really challenging us. And of course, another question here is just like, when you feel connected, you care about others. And who has inspired you by truly caring about others and not of their own importance? Who are some of the leaders around you who you think Usually, the, the, these are not the people that you hear the most. They are not the ones standing in front of big crowds with a camera. Uh, who are the leaders who have really made a difference by their humility? And this is almost self-evident, but empathy and compassion is also muscles that we can train. Uh, Emma Stenström at Stockholm School of Economics is doing a beautiful exercise called bubble hopping, basically where you identify who is really not in your bubble. It could be somebody far out in the right-wing party or somebody with uh, very different values or very different background. And then you meet that person either for lunch or an interview and you really try to understand and empathize with them and understand that if you would have the same genetics and the same experience that they did, you would totally feel and think the same. And what it does with people when we do exercises like the bubble hopping, 
Uh, and now they're doing it with all the students at Stockholm School of Economics, just like they are all do, finding their own personal values and reflecting on them and doing a lot of these exercises on a lab, systemic level with a full university. The last two I'll go through a little bit faster. The communication skills is something that people practice usually in who are working with communications. And we are others are, we take this for granted that we're supposed just to communicate, but you can do it more or less effectively. And I think Simon Anholt is one of, for me, one of the more inspiring speakers, Brene Brown. How does she reach out? If you haven't seen The Power of Vulnerability with Brene Brown, watch that video. Uh, it's one of the most popular and seen TED Talks and see how she communicates. Or Bayou Okomalafe, a Nigerian philosopher who is brilliant at touching people. And if we are to lead a big change, we need to practice this. And not only communicate, we need to also practice co-creation. And it's a big difference between co-creation and collaboration, because collaboration many times has set roles, it has set boundaries, it has a set goal. And then we need to just go and collaborate around it. Or it's like Burning Man, uh, like a festival where you come together and you co-create the content. Uh, or it's like doing a conference that some companies are doing and just saying, we have two days and here I think it's good that we have lunch at 12 and here are some empty slots. Please come with suggestions what we put into these slots and they invite the whole organization to co-create the conference and to source which themes and speakers to have. And then of course, there are some people in charge of uh, making sure it all fits together, but being truly open in what are the goals and purposes that we will get. And you see how this connects to the inclusive in and intercultural competence as the principal of Stockholm School of Economics. I think he had a very big insight, Lars Strannegård. He's one of the most forward thinking presidents of the school that we had and I'm associated with them. That's why I'm going back to the scientists and researchers from there all the time. He realized that, I mean, Stockholm School of Economics is like number seven or something in financial analysts uh, programs in the world. And then he realized that the good chief uh, financial officer, CFO, will not be the one who is the best with numbers because AI is coming and complex analysis will not be it. And he asked himself, so what will the CFO who is really thriving in a global world be good at? And he realized it's the inclusive mindset, intercultural competence, getting people to collaborate, to co-create, understanding people from different value, worlds, values. And just yesterday I saw that he gave the prize of the pedagogical, the prize of the best pedago pedagogical uh, teacher to Emma Stenström, the one that I was telling you about doing the bubble hopping exercises and that trained the students in really taking the perspective of other people because we will need that when we collaborate with people from all, all over the world. We need to actively build trust and not just say there is trust or there is not trust. And there is tools for that. Amy Edmondson, again, from Harvard, is one of the best scientists on this. If you want a good book to read about this and how to get people to collaborate, read The Fearless Organization. It's, it's really an awesome piece of work. And there is another one that's coming up that says the right kind of wrong. I think that Amy will speak about it when she is in Stockholm. Uh, and it's about how do we handle when people make mistakes or there are challenges. And mobilization skills, this is what we're doing now. We're trying to mobilize a lot of people around the shared purpose. And this is something we can train and be better at. Last but not least, uh, courage. I think you're all who are entrepreneurs and social entrepreneurs have this with you. I remember uh, I started a course at Stockholm School of Economics while I was still a student there. And I remember how I was working against the school. I had these posters of like philosophy of life and self-leadership and we're trying to do reflective practices. 
And I remember putting up posters. I, I really looked around like, is somebody seeing that it's actually me doing this course? Because this was so out of the mainstream culture at Stockholm School of Economics then. And I was afraid that people would somehow throw me out for doing philosophical, psychological work in a school that focuses on financial analysts. Uh, and of course, we need to be in touch with our values again. We need to dare to challenge and to disrupt and to go against the stream. And this will always be painful. We will always need to hold that tension. Creativity is a function of a well-integrated brain. And for this, we need rest. And we have a pandemic, other than COVID, that is going on. And coffee has a big part in it. Because when we have a pandemic where people sleep, sleep half an hour to one hour less than they need to. And this makes us do and repeat old patterns over and over again and not see new possibilities. Uh, if you want one book on health to learn more about how you can truly drive change, read Why We Sleep. That book will change your life. It's one of the most important pieces of literature. And I remember I was at a conference in Portugal that was called Concrete Love. And there was a foundation who gave out money to entrepreneurs. And what they said is, we see the hard work you're doing. And here is $10,000. But there's one thing we demand from you in return. And that is that you take a week and rest. And go on vacation. How would you feel if somebody did something like that to you? Just feel into it. And we need that for creativity. We need that to stay optimistic, to have a sense of hope and confidence. And this is also a skill that, that we can train. There is something called train optimism. And it's not being naive. It's not pushing away the challenges, but it's that it's believing that change is possible and to staying persistent and engagement, even though it takes time to see the efforts. And I think we all need and have those skills if we're here gathered today. So if you're interested in this, uh, I ask you to hold the date, whatever you are in the world, there will be a digital possibility to join. If you're somehow limited by finances, we, we will make it possible for people who cannot pay to join the conference digitally still. Uh, we're looking into it. 